Our next guest is Dwight Barron, Chief Technologist for Hyperscale Computing. Dwight, great to see you again. We were talking yesterday. Step up to the microphone. We're here inside the Cube, our flagship telecast. We are here for a special exclusive uh, post-event moonshot project announced by HP this morning. Wall Street Journal, Reuters, all the the major press was here. We're doing a special edition Cube where we are going to do the commentary and analysis to break down uh, what this means. It's a new announcement for HP, and uh, I'm here with my co-host, Dave Vellante. Dave, uh, uh, what's your take so far? And before we jump in with Dwight, what, what's your feeling? Well, Dwight, we've been talking all day about how this feels like an inf- a bigger inflection point than even, say, for instance, Blades, which is obviously a big deal, drove a lot of revenue, uh, 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 pods, you know, kind of evolutionary. But this feels like it's a, a, a major sea change, consumerization of, of IT really driving into the to the data center. So um, we're interested in in the sort of secret sauce and value add that HP brings, right? It used to be in the old days, oh, you'd do a processor and an operating system, and that's really changed. You guys have proven that you can make a lot of money doing other things and building other value. So maybe talk about that a little bit. And, yeah, and, I think and the, yeah. Well, you, you mentioned it in Blades, and, uh, you know, as part of the team that uh, worked on the Blades and that transition. and. And, and it causes us to look at uh, a larger scope of the problems, right? Uh, more than just uh, the servers, here, here, go put them in a rack, put a bunch of cables, have a nice life kind of uh, mentality. To we, we integrated more of the solution. We brought in uh, the connectivity. We looked at uh, the management and the pieces and solved a lot of the problems that we were creating and, uh, you know, to help customers scale up and on their enterprise workloads. I think in the four or five years that we've been in a hyperscale business when we started incubating that we've learned a lot and it's taught us to look at the whole problem you know from a data center level from a you know start at two megawatts or two and a half megawatts of power and work backwards from there how do you how much energy goes into cooling how much goes into the IT equipment um, how do you cut the cooling cost out right when we started this few years ago we were burning two watts on on cooling for every watt we were burning on IT equipment now with pods we barely burn over you know just a fraction of a watt for every hundred watts that we put in IT equipment so we've we've learned a lot by being in this business um, and 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 looking at the holistic problem so pods actually clearly swung the pendulum of the PUE Um, does does this new architecture maintain that, or does it swing back the other way and you have to bring pod-like thinking in to, to maintain that? What, what we've learned with the pods and in, in, in looking at the data center level is we got a tremendous amount of improvement in a quick amount of time. Uh, now we need to go look at, well, what's left over, right, the IT equipment itself. How much, how much work are you getting done for every watch you put in the IT equipment? There's no more wasted watts going into the cooling very, very little losses going into the power distribution. So now we're going to look at, well, what's what's the IT equipment? How, how much work are we getting out of it for every watt that we Finally find? attack the real problem. <laughs> the real <laughs> is, is the low-hanging fruit is uh, what's so, left. So I want to take us back to a kind of a higher-level conversation around the evolution of microprocessors. We were talking earlier, Dave and I, about, you know, um, when you know we were growing up in the computer business, the PC was very disruptive to the Unix and, you know, uh, marketplace. And, you know, you had 80 86 and obviously x86 going up through that um, and that spawned Wintel right. desktops and then servers right. came out after right. kind of first generation why is this announcement and you mentioned you learned a lot so when you looked at the problem x86 is, is a phenomenon that grew up kind of the, kind of the legacy if you will and there's been all kinds of talk about the PC is dead and they talk about that more like a, a desktop being at you know in a queue when you have mobility so when people think about arm which is a big part of this announcement Dwight they think about you know, the benefits of mobile. Right. And people can see that today when they have an Android phone versus an iPhone. One's got better battery than the other. Right. ARM is a big right. part of that. What does that speak to about, one, this new evolution of microprocessors? And, and, and this is a server announcement, so you don't, people tend not to put mobile chipsets technology into a server discussion. Right. So what's your take on this, you know, PC to servers Right. mobile right. angle. Can you just elaborate it from a technical sure. perspective? Sure, and, and you know, so we start with the with the premise of, gosh, we've got to get more computing done for less power, right? And and we look around and we say, well, what's the, what's the leading technologies that know how to get the most amount of computing done for the least amount of power? Well, it's battery-powered things, right? It's, uh, you, you have battery life is, is finite. Everybody wants smaller, thinner devices. If anything, they want a smaller battery. 
and uh, they want more computing done. They want richer web pages. They want it rendered faster. They, uh, so if you, that's the area that we see as the hotbed of really the, the – it's so deep in the DNA of the designs that for every transistor we lay out, we're going to lay it out to, to do the most amount of work for the least amount of power. And when there's no work to be done, we're going to not burn power. And, uh, and so it's really coming from the mobile devices, the client devices, and that could be, you know, you think of laptops, you think of tablets, you think of, of smartphones. But it's that heritage that uh, comes from the mobile devices and the battery power that's making these great strides in, in how to get the most amount of computing. So what's the trade-off there? Uh, well, the trade-off is uh, you, the, the peak speeds that you get in in the transistors that you lay out don't go up to the top end of, of the, the high-speed transistors. But, you know, we learned a long time ago, what, five, six years ago, that the incremental benefit of speed uh, versus power was, was not worth it, right? It was uh, so we, we held the clock rates back and uh, started going to more cores. And uh, so, the, so the clock rates have stayed modest in... Uh, uh, in terms of what the silicon processes can do, yeah. and and we're you know so now you can actually uh, dial the cores back and I mean dial the clocks back and for a certain amount of power uh, you what, can get more work done. What's interesting, Dave, is is that you know the analogy of mobile driving this new server architecture on you know PCs drove the Wintel server. I remember those days when the right. first uh, Intel server came out. It was essentially a 386 mm -hmm. and a 486 processor from Intel, yep. and they were laughed off. Right. You know, out of the market, the land server. It was no, it was laughed. It was right. laughed in the market, but it had a specific use case, and that was right. serving local area networking, yeah. right. Novell in those right. days, right? Yep. Uh, and evolved. Right. So, to me, I think this announcement is very similar in the sense that mm -hmm. this hyperscale announcement, we heard use cases specifically right. around cloud and big data, may look narrow, but if you look at the growth of what happened in the server business. Right. Yeah. With x86, Absolutely. massive growth to Blades. And yeah. Blades was like the glass ceiling from what we're hearing. Yeah. So this is taking – so take us through your vision. Sure. Of, do you see that the same way? Yeah, it's, this it's, is the you know, we've point? been through a, a, a client-to-server transition before, you know, with the, in the desktops. And the, and the real interesting thing to me is the servers that evolved were, you know, reflected what the clients were doing. The clients at the time were doing personal productivity spreadsheets, and the servers at the time – were holding the spreadsheets, the file servers for them, the print servers. They grew up to be the database engines, and until finally they grew up to, to manage all of the workloads in a enterprise business applications. But they they mirrored what the clients were doing, which was business productivity and communications. Today, in the mobile space, you look at these new class of clients that are coming out, and people are doing a whole different set of things within their communications devices, their information devices. So I think that as we transition those client architectures that are being used in these mobile devices into the server space uh, that there's a lot of things that they can reflect of those clients and the new workloads and new applications that will develop just because of the client environment that we're serving with them. Now, that's not necessary for success because today on the Internet, you speak Internet protocol and anything can speak to anything. But uh, when you start thinking about what could be enabled in a client device if, you know, this, you, know you think about pushing state to the cloud from your client device, you know, here's, here's the stuff I'm interested in, this is the context, this is the valuable bits that mean something, and now can I have those bits pushed up to the servers, can I have them pushed anywhere, any, anytime, anything I log into? Well, today we think of that as maybe data, you know, uh, some address book entry or a picture or a note that you jot down. But what if it were the app itself? What if your yeah. mailbox that's running on your client device, when, you, when you're not looking at your so mail... So more power is going to the cloud, obviously. More that, power, yeah. More power is going to push to the cloud, and the cloud push needs it up to have there. data centers. Push, push it up there. Let the app run there for a while. they got... You know, they've yeah. got more resources, they've got more data access, they've got more bandwidth. So there's two major trends we're watching, obviously. At the edge of the network, meaning the device, the endpoint, right. is right. the user, right? And that right. mobile, desktop, tablet, whatever they got. Right. To now a cloud environment, which is more SaaS, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Um, how is the role of new elements in the architecture that we've been hearing, Systems View, Dave, you know, uh, SSD with Flash, right, enabled right. a lot of more integration. 
how is that going to change that evolution? How fast is there? A, is there a, uh, a Moore's law like effect in that market? And what, how do you look at that as a technologist? What are you watching in that in that emerging well, hardware area? Well, so so clearly the solid state memory, the things with flash and uh, things HP Labs is working on called Memristor, all over the category of uh, persistent memory that are electronic that you know have a uh, a mixture of properties. They remember stuff when you turn the power off, but they are accessed electronically, and they're, they're fundamentally silicon devices. That's creating a new uh, kind of middle ground between DRAM memory and rotating media. And, of course, we all see it in the, the, the portable devices that we carry around with us. But, again, back in the server end of it, a lot of the information and the time you wait on information and the power spent to store information is in rotating media, and uh, we believe in the next few years. We've already seen a huge transition to basically all of the what's called random I.O., the things you got to move the mechanical disk head around and wait a few milliseconds for. A lot of that is already going to solid-state media, and the answers come back in, you know, a thousand times faster, uh, microseconds. But um, the the capacity stuff, you know, i got to... A gigab- gigabytes of files, well, uh, it's, it's still cheaper to put that on magnetic media, but even that's going to move to solid state. Within your environment that you're talking to your customers and or the HP Labs guys you talk to, you probably have some insight into kind of uh, these uh, these emerging use cases. Uh, share with us your vision of your experiences, either anecdotally or specifically the um, big data phenomenon. You know, How real is it? I mean, obviously we cover it. We have an opinion on that. Um, how does it affect all this this equation? Oh, it's it's uh, it's it's huge. I mean, the the customer experience that's enabled by big data, knowing what you want, when you want it, uh, trying to lure you into buying it, uh, figuring out how you're going to pay for it later. Uh, all of that is built on personalized big data analysis. Uh, it's you know it's basically the financial model that's that's driving all the e-commerce, driving the websites. So that part is huge. I mean, it's already here. Now the question is, uh, how do the rest of us get it? And uh, how do enterprises get access to the data? We see that uh, happening. So there's, we think, a lot of growth in these same tools and techniques that the web companies are using to you know, look at what their customer trends are. So We're basically big data is coming to bi- the business. It's, it's, it is. It's already it's there. It's already here. It's, yeah. it's here. And this and is the kind of machines that they want. This is and the this kind is, of purpose-built, yeah. big data powerhouse machine. You hit the nail on the head, purpose-built. It's like how do we optimize not only the compute architecture that goes with it, but the whole package, the solution, and make it easy to consume and fit it in there in the framework that, that uh, the customers know how to deal with. Well, if Dave doesn't have any more questions, I have one kind of different question, kind of change gears, because you know, it's, we love to get uh, guys, chief technical guys on the cube to talk about uh, trends. But more importantly, um, one of the things we're passionate about Silicon Angle and Wikibon is there's a new generation of uh, computer scientists and uh, engineers, uh, whether they're data scientists or actually programmers, hardware and software. And the, the, the business disciplines are changing from a, from a personnel standpoint. Um, could you talk about the new requirements? Because we're talking about jewels, we're talking about power, talking about uh, you know chip level, double E electrical engineering type discipline. But it's also a little bit of computer science um, for folks out there who are in the younger generation. You know, what would you advise them and share with them about the the kind of curriculum or expertise they would need to learn to m- master and and have a career in this area? Yeah, I, I think the. Uh the biggest thing that's most important is to realize that almost every problem that we tackle today is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, You know, we we started off talking about uh, the biggest challenges in uh, advancing the state of computing in a data center. Uh, turns out to be the air conditioner. So, uh, you know, I've uh, partnered with uh, (laughs) with colleagues. ITT Technical Institute is going to be graduating some serious uh, engineers. But... uh, but you know, we had to I had to blow the dust off of the old thermodynamics <laughs> books and uh, go back and say, "Oh yeah, I had a course in that once." What are, what are they talking about? So when you say um, in college, I'm never going to use this. You know what? Yeah. You know, actually, and, uh, could, you could use it. <laughs> but but it, it truly is a, a multidisciplinary approach to the problems. It's when the it's the hardware, the software, the mechanical engineering, both from a packaging. Um, you know, even in the electrons uh, will. We'll be converting them to photons very soon, 
and the primary communication means when you think about chip to chip, uh, won't even be electrons anymore. So uh, that's a lot of deep physics and uh, a lot of work there. So I think the biggest thing is, you know, uh, study what you love, do what you love. Uh, you, you know, there's no no need going through life being miserable when you when there's so many fun things to go do. Um, but uh, learn how to be a partner, learn how to team. Uh, you know, and I know many of the colleges and, and uh, curriculums are uh, really, really encouraging teamwork and cross-disciplinary work, and we're encouraging them to do that uh, because, you know, there's the, the Some creativity that if you too peaked on oh, yeah. one topic, you yeah. might not see a solution that yeah, might require just a little bit out of the box thinking. Yeah. yeah, just looking at, you know, I've seen this time and time again in my careers, you know, people will get siloed looking at a problem just from one dimension, can't, you know, tackle the problem nearly as effectively as a multidiscipline team and, and uh, you know, wrestle it to the ground from multiple dimensions. Uh, I'm right. interested um, from the st- your standpoint, what is a technologist, on the, the, the concept of differentiation. Um, you know, people think, oh, you know, everything's commodity and it's going commodity, but, but uh, I've been writing down, just listening to our conversation, ways in which you can differentiate. Be first. There's the ecosystem. You, you talk about packaging the platform itself that you guys are building. Um, what are the ways in which you see as HP adding value, providing differentiation, and ultimately being able to drive a profit out of this business? Well, let's first start with uh, have yet to walk into a customer visit and they go, hey, Dwight, all my problems are solved. You can go home. Here's a check. I'm ready to buy this, and, and uh, I don't have any more problems that need solving. So uh, there's uh, a lot of pain, a lot of a lot of problems out there to be solved. And I don't care who they are, how big they are, or, or how well they've got a handle on their operations. There's 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 more problems to be solved. Um, I, I've always subscribed to the theory that uh, if we can help our customers lower the cost of delivering a transaction to their customer by an order of magnitude. They've got two orders of magnitudes more things waiting in the wings that are now profitable to deliver as, tra- as business transactions. So you, so you think about how much richer the websites have gotten, you know, as a business transaction, how much more they put into building a website or an e-commerce site or for you. And that's because we made them cheaper to deliver over time. So behind that become, comes increased complexity. Uh, it's uh, increased nodes. So managing it, decreasing the complexity, making it reliable, Making the parts show up on time when they're supposed to and, and uh, operate reliably. It's a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, to, to add value here for our customers. So we've got somebody who actually uh, uh, Skyped in a question. Will the applications developed for mobile clients move to these new servers in the same way as the Microsoft client moved to, to Windows servers? In other words, is this the end of the Microsoft Intel duopoly? What's your, your take on that? Uh, no, I don't. Well... So, so first off, uh, this isn't the end of anything Intel. This is we're, we're uh, uh, the beginning of everything HP. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, there we go. it's the uh, it's, it's it's you know it's the beginning of uh, a new round of experiments, and uh, we're going to start with new hardware and a new server architecture for the software that exists today, right? So open source in particular. O- open source, you know, web servers, Hadoop, Hadoop things. Yeah. It's just a. It's um, only four or five categories of applications that we think are good candidates to start with, but we've done our homework there. We've done uh, quite a bit of homework over the last two or three years in in measuring these things and building models and uh, benchmarks. So so we think those will have a high degree of success, right? So it, you know, software and hardware. When you're trying to build something new, it's always referred to as chicken and egg, yeah, yeah. right? So. So today's software is the chicken, and then we'll start with a new hardware. Well, you guys are putting this out there today. I mean, what I was impressed with today is, um, you know, you always, these announcements, you always kind of like, uh, you know, just another, you know, rah, rah announcement. But, you know, it's a use case that's really relevant right. with big data, as you mentioned, and cloud. Right. It's bursting out at the seams. Right. I mean, technically, there's issues. Right. You know, I mean, growth issues, right. challenges. And it's a new generation, so it's like literally move from that, like PC to servers, right. now mobile to new kind of servers. So right. to me, I think it's a really good uh, vision, and I totally uh, think that's what the market needs. I mean, you know, we know a little bit about the data. So we're doing a little, our own little Hadoop right. stuff, and, and we know what it costs. I mean, right. it's $600 to buy a, bla- uh, a box, right. a pizza box, right. cheap. Yeah. But I don't need 
three quarters of the stuff in there. I'd love to have four of them in one smaller box. So the market's changing, and you know, if you can deliver performance at that level, you know, it's a winner. And again, obviously, the ecosystem's huge. I mean, you got to have the right, you know, incentives. And we asked, you know, Mike Kimball. You kind of didn't really answer the question because it sounds like it's just getting started, um, which makes sense. Yeah, and but we'll use today's software to to build and, and support a new round of hardware, and then as that hardware gets established, then a new round of software will get established. I mean, we're hearing that there's a tsunami of developers out there that are that are growing up uh, right. a new ge- younger generation. That's like I call it third generation open source. That yeah. um, you know we just we covered the passing of the guy who invented C. Um, recently, and uh, you know that was a lot of the early guys talking about that. But really, two generations away, and you have these software guys that they don't really have any insight into port configurations, a lot of the stuff that goes on at the network level. Right. And so, all they do on is code, and they're coding on open source. So, portable porting code like that is really key. And if they can have a programmable web on top of it, right. I think that's a great foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dwight Barron, thanks for joining the Cube. First time, time. Chief Technologist.